All right, this morning we're going to talk about who really runs hell. Okay? Now, I'm sure everybody here, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because you know, I know you'd all raise your hand. I'm sure everybody here has seen the drawings, the cartoon drawings of Satan sitting on a throne surrounded by flames, you know, and, and the idea is that Satan is the ruler of hell and God's up there in heaven and they're kind of at war with one another, you know. And people say, well, isn't that what the Bible teaches? No, not even close. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's a lie. And unfortunately, that lie is often told by people that should know better. Bible believers. Okay, it's, it's often depicted in things in some gospel tracts that Satan's down there ruling in hell. You say, well, as long as we get people saved, I'm sorry, it's never right to do wrong. Okay, you should not be drawing Satan in hell. He's not there. And we're going to look at the, what the Bible has to say about that. Uh, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. How did it all begin for Satan? What was he? And, uh, you know, how did he become uh, Satan? What happened there? Isaiah chapter 14, we're going to start at verse 12. And as is typical with all studies, you know, I could get into a lot more detail, but, you know, we try to keep these messages right around an hour or so, and, you know, I, I can't get into all the scriptures, so I'm just going to be hitting a couple of things there. Okay, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, a very famous verse here, it says, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? Let me stop there for a minute, okay? How art thou fallen from heaven? So where was his original position? It was in heaven. Okay, now if you use anything but a King James Bible, they'll mess with this verse. They won't say Lucifer. Why? Because the new versions are inspired by Satan. Now you might not like to hear that, but the fact is Satan is a master counterfeiter. You know, I heard a brother say this week, he said, if Satan wrote a counterfeit Bible, he wouldn't take everything out of it. That'd be too obvious. He just puts a little leaven in, and that leavens the whole lump, as Jesus warned about. Okay, so right here's your correct reading. Okay, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. Okay, now a few things we need to notice from these verses. Number one, Lucifer fell from heaven. Was he in hell at that point? Does it say he was cast down to hell at first? No. He was cast down to the ground. Okay. Uh, why? Well, he tried to be God. Not a God, lowercase g. He tried to be God. Almighty God. And we're going to see in just a little bit what that sin was. And the third thing you need to notice is that it says he shall be brought down to hell. Has that happened yet? No, he's not been sent down to hell yet. Now, he will be eventually, but it's not going to be to rule hell. Okay, we're going to see later why Satan goes to hell, why he ends up in the lake of fire. We're going to see what the reason of that is. Okay, turn to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 11. The two chapters in your Bible... The King James Bible to talk about Satan before and after the fall are Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay, there's a lot in the Bible about Satan, about what he's doing, about how he deceives people, he's the father of lies, but the two chapters that talk mainly about who he was before and after the fall and what his future is, those two chapters are Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Okay, we're going to start out here in verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. 
Okay, Satan here is called the king of Tyrus. What's that mean? It means that he has political rule on this earth. You say, oh, come on now. You know, that's not in the news. They never talk about Satan ruling the earth. Then it can't be true because if it was true, the news media would cover it, right? <laughs> right. Uh-huh. Wrong. <laughs> no, not true. Okay, he's called the king of Tyrus. And we're going to get into, I think, one of the reasons why he's called the king of Tyrus in a little bit here. Okay, but he does have political rule on the earth. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, we're not going to turn there. But uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8 says, And the devil taking him up into an high mountain showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, the him there being Jesus, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. In verse 8, Luke chapter 4, verse 8 says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Did Why didn't Jesus say to him, That's not true. You have no political power here. You don't have rule over the kingdoms of this world. That's not true. Jesus didn't say that. You know why he didn't say it? Because what Satan was saying was true. Satan is the God of this world. He has been given dominion over this world right now. And if you want to have political power, guess what you have to do? You have to worship Satan. I'll tell you that. And I think if you get high enough up, I don't mean a president of the United States. Presidents of the United States are a joke. Okay, most of those guys, they're figureheads, they're puppets. They do what they're told. You got Obama, he reads off teleprompters. You know, and if you ever see guys like that when they don't have their speeches written for them, they stumble all over themselves. They don't know what to say. You know, those guys aren't, they don't have any power at all. They're not the ones that are really running the show. I'm talking the guys, the guys that really are running things in this world, you'll never know their names. You'll never know what they look like. You'll never know who they are. Okay? That's just simply the way it is. And. You know, it's interesting because I remember hearing a thing years ago. There's a political commentator guy, and I'm not endorsing everything that he says or does, but he's a man named Webster Tarpley. And he really knows a lot about politics. The guy speaks a couple languages. I mean, he's a very intelligent man. And when he started to research the elite of the world, uh, I remember one researcher was talking about this, and he said that he met with him, and he was like, you know, these guys are into the occult. And this Webster Tarpley guy was laughing at him. He's like, oh, come on. You don't really believe that these guys are into the occult, do you? I mean, that's conspiracy stuff. And the guy's like, keep researching. You're going to find it out. And I remember Webster Tarpley talking the one time. I listened to an interview he did, and he said, the more I researched, I couldn't ignore the fact that, yes, these men are into the occult. These men worship a being named Satan. It's right there. You know, right now, as I'm speaking here in July, there's a, a uh, private party, I guess you could call it, private meetings going on right now out in Monterio, California, up above San Francisco, out in the Redwood Groves. It's called the Bohemian Grove. It's been going on for over 100 years, well over 100 years. I think it was 1830-something, I think, when it started, if I remember correctly. And you have all the powerful elite of the world going to this grove, only men, and there they commit basically human sacrifice and they worship a, a giant owl god. And they have a lot of other weird stuff that they do. And you say, oh, come on now, this is crazy. I don't believe in this stuff. Research it. It's true. It's absolutely true. Why? Because the Bible says it. Okay? The Bible says this stuff and it lines up perfectly. And by the way, during their ceremony, during their ritual, where they burn a body, they say in effigy, you know, that it's not a real body, but I can prove that at least one year it was a real body, whatever. But during this ceremony, where they do this thing, they say about Babylon and goodly Tyre. Isn't it interesting that they would mention Tyre? 
when right here in your Bible it says the king of Tyrus. Satan is listed as the king. And they're talking about that in their ceremony. See, I'm telling you, this book right here, when people laugh at this book and they mock this book, it's because they're ignorant. They don't really know what's going on. They believe the phony world that's put out there by the mainstream media. The real world is very different from what most people think. And the real world, the facts, the things that are really going on, line up perfectly with the King James Bible. Absolutely perfectly. And that's why I'm so militant in my stand for the King James Bible, because this is the source of all truth right here. Amen. The things that are weird, and you look at the King James Bible and you say, I don't know if I can believe that, that's really strange. That's the real truth. And the more you research, the more you'll prove this book. Okay? Uh, another verse I want to read here quickly, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, if we could just get Obama out of there, if we could just, you know, kick him out, we'll re elect a Republican and then he'll make things better. <laughs> yeah, wrong. Not going to happen. Okay, we're wrestling, wrestling against spiritual powers. And at the very top of that is Satan. Just like the Bible teaches. Okay? Satan's not down in hell. He's not down there ruling and reigning and think Satan has rule on this earth. And we're going to see that as we continue here. Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 13. Jump down there. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. You say, and some people say, well, this, this passage here is about a king in Tyrus. Really? Was there a, a human king? That was in the Garden of Eden? No. Go back to Genesis and read who was in the Garden. There were four characters mentioned who were in the Garden. There was God, there was Adam, there was Eve, and there was Satan. And look at the passage here. It can only be referring to one. Okay? It's not referring to Adam because Adam had been dead a long time before this book was written. Okay? This is talking about somebody who's still around these passages. But anyhow, we'll continue here. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. There's a whole lot you could say about that, but I'm not going to get into that. Um, about how that he probably had was able to have musical instruments as part of who he was and could actually, you know, was, you know, people say the heavenly choir director. Well, I don't know, but probably there's some truth to that. And uh, watch out, by the way, for apostates like, well, not apostates, but uh, wicked devils, ministers of Satan like Rick Warren that say that God has no preferences in music. Look out for that. Satan's area of influence is music. Be real careful about the kind of music you listen to and promote. Verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Remember, remember what we read there in Isaiah 14? You know, in the sides of the north. It says here, Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. What are the stones of fire? I have no idea. Okay, there's a lot of things here I don't understand. Okay, and I accept it by faith. I know it's true. Uh, verse 15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. We're going to see about that iniquity here as we continue. Okay, now, a couple questions here. Would God have left a fallen this Satan here, would, would he have left him into the Garden of Eden knowing that he was fallen? No, I don't think so. I think that he got into the Garden of Eden because he was still, you know, right before God. I think that's the only reason he got in there. And you say, well, then why was Satan, why did he cause Eve to sin? What was that all about? Well, I do believe that 
the original sin there of Satan, the thing of him trying to be God, was how he deceived Eve. Mm -hmm. I believe that's why he got kicked out of heaven. And by the way, if you think that's just a minor thing, if you think Satan's rebellion happened before the Garden of Eden, let me just point out, because of what Satan did in the Garden of Eden, he brought sin and death into the world. That was not a minor thing. That was a major thing. Okay, and read what God said. We're not going to go to it, but read what God said to Satan, you know, in Genesis 3, there, after he basically falls. He said, I'll cast you to the ground, and you're going to crawl around on your belly like a snake. You know, that's what he said. I think that Satan's fall from heaven was in Genesis chapter 3. I think that that's when it happened. Yeah. I'm real sorry, but this this nonsense of a pre-Adamite rebellion and Satan rebelling and stuff like that, and there was a uh, the gap theory and all this, I think that's a bunch of nonsense. I think it is an unscriptural compromise to the evolution theory. I don't believe it. I think it's nonsense. Okay? I'm not going to separate company with brethren that believe that way, but I think you've been deceived. Plain and simple. We have some good messages on that. You can hear those. Okay? Uh, let's continue here. Look at verse 16. Um, it says here, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now, of course, if you want to go to the real, true, real strong application of that, I think it's going to happen at the end of a millennium, right before the great white throne judgment. I think is when the, the full fulfillment of verse 17 there is going to happen. But I think it's also, there's some truth to it as far as being from Satan's fall in Genesis 3 the whole way up through to actually the end of the tribulation when he's cast into the bottomless pit. I do believe that kings will behold him. I do believe that. I believe that when you get up to the very highest levels of powers here in this in this world, I do believe that some of these people very possibly are seeing Satan physically. Do I have any proof of it? Just what the Bible says. I believe the Bible. You know, it says it. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. You know, it's right there. Okay, now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 2. People say, okay, well, you know, if this is true, if it were true that Satan is physically here on the earth someplace and, you know, people can behold him, then where is he? You know, where is he at? I'm going to show you some more scriptures on this. Revelation chapter 2 verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith, even in those days where, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Was Antipas slain in hell? No. Was Antipas slain in heaven? No. <laughs> Where was he slain? I have no idea. On the earth, yeah. He was slain down here somewhere on the earth. And I looked it up. I tried to do a little bit of research on this. And the fact is, Antipas, the name Antipas, appears only one time in the King James Bible. And it's right there. There's no more mention of him. Where is he slain? I have no idea. But wherever he was slain, that's where Satan dwelleth. It's right there. Satan is not down in hell. He's here on the earth, physically, someplace. You say, well, man, you ought to do some research on that. No, I'm not going to. You know why? 
Because I don't want to go where Satan dwelleth. You know? And let me just kick something else here real quick. Be very careful how far you get into studying the occult. Amen. If you find out that there's some kind of a witchcraft place or something, don't try to infiltrate it. If you, you know, I heard a story the one time there was a Buddhist temple over in like Thailand or something. And this missionary went over there and he, and he went in and he started praying right in the middle of this, this uh, Buddhist temple. You know, making a big show and everything. The guy lost his mind. Be very careful about messing around with the occult type of stuff. I walked into an occult festival the one time not knowing any better. I thought it was supposed to be the Renaissance Fair. I thought, you know, I took my nephews. I thought it was going to be like this reenactment thing of guys riding around on horseback, you know, with armor on, you know, knights and stuff like that. And it was just filled with Satanism. Every kind of divination you could imagine and everything else. And you say, oh, man, we ought to go back. We ought to get the, a bunch of Bible believers back there and go back and pray. And, you know, no, stay away from that stuff. OK, you shouldn't be fascinated and say, I want to find out where Satan dwelleth. And I want to go over there and do a documentary film and stuff. Stay away from it. OK, that's not your your job as a Christian. All right. Now, look at Revelation Chapter 13, we're going to see another tie-in here to this thing of where Satan dwelleth. And I have some ideas, but uh, we'll have to see here. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Look at this. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So, wherever Satan's seat is, he eventually gives it over to the Antichrist, the beast. Now, there's a lot of speculation. You know, some people say Vatican City. I think that's a very real possibility, <laughs> you know. And could it be that there's some special place over there in St. Peter's Basilica or something with, where, you know, don't go in that door there, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, only certain people can go in there and, and meet with Satan. Or I, I don't know. I don't know. Some people say it's in uh, geographic Babylon, you know, over in Iraq, some places where Satan dwelleth, where his seat is. Some people say in different areas. I don't know. I really don't know. You know, you can debate that thing all you want to, but the fact is you're not really going to be able to prove anything unless you're actually here and see it. And if you're saved, you're not going to be here to see the Antichrist rise to power. Amen. You know, it's just the way it is. But again, here you see Revelation chapter 2, it talks about where Satan dwelleth, where his seat is, and he eventually gives that power and authority and his seat to the Antichrist. And guess what? It's not in hell. That's the purpose of this sermon. I don't want to, the purpose of this sermon is not to tell you exactly where Satan is and I have a photograph of him and all this stuff and I want to get video of him and we'll set up secret, you know, put a hidden camera in so we can get, no. Stay away from that stuff. But what you need to realize, and we're going to see the importance of this as we continue, well, what you need to realize is Satan is not in hell. He does not want to go to hell. Okay? He doesn't rule hell. That's very, very important. And that's why I'm doing this message. Now, we're going to go back to Job chapter 1. And again, I've covered this in many different studies, but, you know, part of the thing of, of being a Bible believer is to constantly renew your mind. Go over the Scripture over and over again so it's burned into your brain so you can remember it. Because the, the false prophets come along and they try to deceive you by getting you to, do not, to deny what you've been told. Okay, they get you to turn away your ears from the truth and to be turned unto fables, like the Bible warns about. Okay, Job chapter 1, verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God, 
church. In the Old Testament, they're angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now people say, well, see, it says in the earth, so that means he's underground, you know, the underground bases under there. It doesn't mean that. Okay. And how do you know that? Well, Jump down to the next verse. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now Job wasn't walking around in subterranean underground worlds. <laughs> he was on the earth. Okay, That's just the way it is. I mean, I live in the state of Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. That doesn't mean I live in the ground of Pennsylvania. Okay, so don't fall for that either. I've heard some guys try to say that, that Satan was in the earth and walked up and down in, you know, trying to mean underground. Doesn't mean that. Okay, but you see there again, Satan's walking around and dealing on the earth. That's what the Bible says. Turn over to Job chapter 2. Job chapter 2 verse 1. Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Did you know Satan has to give an account for everything that he does? Look at verse 2. And the Lord said un, unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Now let me stop there. Do you think the Lord didn't know what Satan was doing? That's not why he's asking him the question. He's saying, from whence comest thou? In other words, you tell me what you were doing. And if you lie to me, if you if you say, well, you know, I wasn't doing anything, then you're going to be in trouble. And Satan knows that. And that's why Satan gives us the same answer. And Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. <laughs> he was honest. Well, I'm walking around on the earth, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm walking around that's an answer and you know satan knows what that that god knows everything that he's trying to plot and everything that he's doing <laughs> satan knows that sounds like a very political answer yeah it is a very political answer exactly but again my point is here satan's not in hell he's not ruling in hell he's not some kind of an en enemy down there that God's going, oh, I wish I could defeat him. Boy, that guy, he's so bad. He's down there in hell, and, you know, I wish we could have a fighter. That's not it. Okay? Satan has no power down there in hell. He doesn't want to go there. Where Satan's power is, where his kingdom is, is on this earth. Physical rule on this earth. <clears throat> it's what the Bible teaches. Okay. Turn to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. So we've seen from this study so far that Satan is here physically someplace on the earth. Again, I don't know where. I'm not sure where he's at. But he is down here someplace. And he has to report to God. Occasionally he must go up and present himself before the Lord and give an account of what he's doing. And by the way, if you look at Job also, another thing that you can learn is that Satan has to get permission from God to attack a believer. Job wasn't what we would call a Christian. The disciples are called Christians first in Antioch. But Job was a saved man. Okay, And Satan had to get authority and and permission from God before he could do anything to him. So some people say, oh, I, you know, I remember hearing one guy said that he, he doesn't believe that the book of Job was, uh, should be part of the Bible because it's a cruel thing and all this. No, Job is one of the most important books in your Bible because it shows what Satan has to do before he can attack you. It shows who's really in authority. Okay, it's a very important book. But now, what's the future of Satan? Okay, the book of Revelation, uh, most of the events in there have not happened yet. 
but they're going to happen. So look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. It says here, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Watch out for people that are worshiping angels. Okay? They're not all good angels. There are some bad ones too. Uh, verse 8, And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And some people try to say, well, that's the, the casting out that happened in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Satan is not totally cast out of heaven until the future. Remember what you read in the book of Job? Satan was down here on the earth. Yeah, he was put down here to rule and reign and have dominion over the, the kings of the earth. But he still had to report to God. Now in the future, during the time of Jacob's trouble, Satan is actually kicked out permanently. Get out. You're not allowed in here anymore. Now, that's good for us, but it's really, really bad for the earth. And we're going to see that. Let's continue. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Who's dwelling in heaven? If there's a post-tribulation rapture. Christians are up there. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. He's going to have, essentially, I think this happens about midway through the time of Jacob's trouble, so Satan is going to have three and a half years before Jesus Christ comes back physically to the earth and casts him well, an angel casts him into the bottomless pit. We're going to see that in just a little bit here. Three and a half years to a being who's approximately 6,000 years old. Probably, I, you know, I think it, that's probably about how old he was, or is. That's a very short time. And he's going to realize, I don't have much time. I'm going to have to destroy as many of these people as I can. Okay? <laughs> Really, really, really going to be a bad thing. Uh, verse 13, And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness into her place, where she is nursed for a time and times and half a time. Time is one year, times are two year, and half a time is half a year. So you have three and a half years. It says here, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he, he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And you say, well, what's the flood there? Is that actual water? No, I don't believe it is. Read Revelation chapter 17 about the woman which sitteth upon many waters. And it says about what are the waters, it says that they are people. So I think that if you make the tie in here, I think that the armies of the Vatican, which will be in full power at this time, I think that those armies are going to be hunting down the Jews. Just like they did in the past, by the way. The Crusades. They went and they killed Jews and stole their riches. Yep. That's what's going to happen. Okay, and there's quite a few things I could rabbit trail on, but we'll continue here. Verse 16, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Tribulation saints is what you're reading about there. Primarily Jews. Okay, the seed of the woman. The woman being Israel, not Mary. Sorry. <laughs> okay, now a couple of things we need to look at there uh, in this passage that we just read. First of all, Where's Satan at right now? <clears throat> he's physically on the earth, but he's still reporting to God in heaven. 
He's not been kicked out of heaven yet. Okay? Number two, uh, Satan will be there. And I do believe this. This is kind of weird to think about. But I do believe that Satan is going to be there in heaven when we're called up to be with the Lord. I think he's still going to be presenting himself. Just the timing of it. Think about it. Pre-tribulation rapture. We're up there. Halfway through the tribulation, Satan's kicked out. So for three and a half years, he's going to be there. Weird to think about. <laughs> but that's what the Bible teaches. Okay, and now this is just a theory of mine. I can't prove it, but I'll just throw it out there. You can think about it, whatever you <clears throat> want to think. But uh, maybe the Lord is actually going to have Satan there for the judgment seat of Christ. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Accused him before the Lord day and night. I don't know. I read that and I thought, huh, maybe he'll be there. Kind of like a trial or something. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he'll just have to sit there and watch us being rewarded and not be able to do anything to stop it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <clears throat> and... Of course, I kind of touched on this earlier, but Satan had to behave before. You know, he had to report to God. But when he's cast out into the earth, I think that God's going to say at that point, you just go ahead and do whatever you want down there. Don't hurt the 144,000. You know, don't kill all of them. But you read through the book of Revelation, there's an awful lot of killing that's going on. And it really heats up in that last half of the tribulation really heats up. And I'll tell you something else. A lot of these false prophets that believe in a post-trib rapture, a lot of them are trying to back off on how severe it's going to be. They're trying to ease up. They're trying to say, it's actually not going to be that bad. Be you know, these, these pre-trib rapture people have really blown it up out of proportion. They're exaggerating. No. No. You read about it. Over half the world's population is going to be killed. Now, you, you get a hold of that one. There's about 7 billion people right now on the earth, right around there. 3.5 billion people dead? That's quite substantial. You know, water's turning to blood. You know, all the creatures dying, creatures coming after people. You know, hailstones. I mean, man, don't tell me it's not going to be bad. It's going to be really bad. Uh,. Okay, Revelation chapter 20. Go there next. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Okay, it says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan. Is there any doubt as to who it is? No. And bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So you see right there, Satan still is not in hell. Even at the end of this time period where he comes down for the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, the end of the tribulation, even after that, he still is not ruling in hell. But he's cast into the bottomless pit. For a thousand years. Okay. And he'll be down there during the millennium, by the way. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Jump down there. And when the seven, or, or when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So Satan finally enters into hell. But it doesn't happen until after the Millennial Kingdom. Now, you say, well, I don't know. I think he still rules hell. Okay, give me one scripture. 
Show me in the Bible where it says that Satan is ruling in hell. It doesn't. It just simply does not say that. And I'm going to show you who rules it, uh, who's really controlling hell here as we continue. But look at verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Who cast him into the lake of fire? Was it Satan? Satan was cast in in verse 10. Okay? He gets cast in before the great white throne judgment. That's something to think about there. Who's casting him into hell? God. Oh, I just, I can't believe this. I can't believe this horrible thing. Okay, go to Matthew chapter 10. Now we're going to see, we've seen there about Satan. Seen about him. Now we're going to see who's actually the one that's casting into hell. Who actually rules over hell and controls it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. It says here, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Is that Satan? No, it's God. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Go back a couple chapters. Matthew chapter 5, verse 29. Matthew 5.29 says, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Hell is a very horrible place. Very horrible. And you would actually do better maiming yourself to avoid sinning than to just say, ah, I'm not worried about it. You know, God will judge me and I'll, he'll see I'm a good person and, you know, I'll, I'll get in there. You know, oh, I've sinned a little bit, but yeah, everybody sins now and then. It's not the attitude that you should have. It's a very, very serious thing to go to hell. Matthew chapter 7. Turn to Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You say, well, there will be good people that will make it into heaven, won't there? Let's look about that. Matthew seven twenty one, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy, thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Hmm. So I guess good works aren't going to get you in. And by the way, what's the will of my Father there? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I mean, these guys, you know, I, one of the best questions that you can ask to a lost, self-righteous sinner when they start saying, well, I think, you know, when I get up there, God's going to weigh my good works against my bad works and blah, blah, blah. And they talk about, oh, I'm not that bad and I'm a good person and I've done good things. You say, okay, if you're judged by your works, why did God allow Jesus to die on the cross? What was the point? See? The will of the Father. Remember what Jesus said when he was in the garden? Not my will, but thine be done. To the Father. What was God's will? He had to have a perfect sacrifice to pay for sin. Because he knew we could never be righteous enough to earn heaven. So the will of the Father 
is for you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to drop your your self-righteousness. That's the will of the Father. Most people are never going to do that. Because they've created a God that does not appear in this book. I'm going to get into that more too as we continue. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 verse 47. Okay, Matthew 13 and verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Angels have a part in casting people into hell. And who controls the angels? God. These angels, anyhow. It's talking about the kingdom of heaven. There are fallen angels, but they don't have any kind of power to be casting people into hell. Okay, you're not going to find that in the Bible. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 42. Okay, Mark chapter 9, verse 42 says, And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck, and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Now, of course, you couldn't read all those verses if you have a new version particularly the NIV. They take out verses 44 and 46. And why do, they, why do they do that? Well, because they're satanic in their origin. You have to deal with that. Okay, it's not, well, you know, I think it's okay to use... No, it's of the devil to use these versions that take these verses out. You see, because whenever you see something repeated and repeated and repeated in the Bible, it's because the Lord's trying to get it through to people and trying to make it stick. Okay, what's repeated? Where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Two things you need to get from that. Number one, it says their worm dieth not. It does not say the worm dieth not. And there's, again, huge study here, can't get into it, but it's very possible that, you know, when we are, our resurrected bodies as Christians are conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And it's very possible that if you are lost and you end up in hell, your body that you'll have for eternity could be conformed to the image of Satan, the serpent. So you're going to be basically a worm down there. And that worm that you become will not die. It'll last forever. You know, something to think about. And it says there too that the fire is not quenched. You know, these poor Catholics are told, even the best Catholics out there are still told that they're going to burn a little bit. What a stupid religion. I'm sorry, but it is. Why would you want to be part of something like that? Knowing that even if I do the very best that I can, I mean, they say that Mother Teresa and all the popes, the popes still go to, to purgatory and burn for a while. And these poor Catholics, I don't think that when they get down there, they're going to realize they've been conned. But... These poor Catholics have this mentality that I'm going to burn for a little bit and then it'll be over. I'll be purified. No, you won't. If you're a Catholic and you die without Jesus Christ, you die without coming out of that wicked system, you're going to go down there and you're going to burn and you're going to burn and you're going to burn. Forever. The fire's not ever going to go out. It says so right there. Okay? But there are three things that are mentioned there. 
three things that will cause you to sin and get you condemned to eternity in hell. First one is there in uh, verse 43, it says your hand. Well, what's your hand? It's the things that you touch that God tells you not to. Verse 45 is your feet, your foot. Well, that's because you go places where God says you shouldn't go. What about verse 47? Your eye. You look at things that you shouldn't be looking at. Right there. So what is it that causes you to sin? Is it the devil? Well, he can throw temptations out there, but the fact is, it's your own eye, your own hand, your own foot. Okay? Look in the mirror. That's your worst enemy. And that's why you have to rely on somebody else for salvation. And if people, until people get away from self-righteousness, until they get away from that, until they repent, which means turning from it, you are to repent to God. You turn from your own self-righteousness, you turn to God and say, He's the only one that can save me. And until you get to that point, you can't be saved. And you pray some magical little prayer to let Jesus come into your life and things because you want to you want to know Jesus and he's a nice guy. That's not going to work until you turn from your own self-righteousness. You have to realize who this being is that the Bible calls God. You have to realize who he is. You have to realize the fact, which is what I'm the point of this message, you have to realize the fact he is the one that's going to send you to hell. He is the one. Not the bad boogeyman Satan. Satan's not down in hell. He has no power over hell. He's going to go there eventually. Okay? We'll continue here. I'm going to get hit that just a little bit more as we continue. Hebrews chapter 10. You say, well, I don't know if I like this thing about, you know, associating our loving Heavenly Father with hell. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 11, the first part says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord? Well, oh, that doesn't seem consistent. We'll look here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. Here you have for the tribulation saint. Okay, this is not church age doctrine, but we're going to see some instruction in righteousness here. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 for if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now in the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble, if you take the mark of the beast, it doesn't matter what profession you've made beforehand. You take the mark of the beast and worship the beast. The two are connected. Okay, if you do that, you're, you're done. You're lost. You're on your way to hell. No exceptions. Okay? Verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under the underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace Look at verse 30. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You say, well, that's for the lost people. The lost people, they have to really be afraid of God. Uh, guess what, Christian? It's for you too. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I mean... Realize who you're dealing with. You need to be reverent before the Lord. You're not dealing with a, a buddy that lives down the road or something like that that you can go out fishing with or something. You are dealing with the God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. He wouldn't, need, he wouldn't, wouldn't even need to touch you to destroy you. A thought could destroy you. That's a fearful thing. Okay? And as a Christian, you need to have that reverential fear of God. It keeps you from sinning. 
it helps you to realize, hey, I'm going to be judged by God. I'm not going to go to hell because I'm saved. I'm born again by the blood of Jesus Christ. But I'm still accountable to this being that knows my thoughts. We can't forget about that. Okay, I heard a, a good thing here recently. Uh, a brother said, and I've heard this term before, and it's but it's a very good term. He said that uh, today, he said, we have cafeteria Christians. And what is that? Well, they go through the line and they go through the Bible and they just say, well, I'll take a little of this and I'll take a little of that, but I don't want any of that. I don't want any of this. That's not how it's supposed to be. And let me tell you something. You, are, you will be pressured when you get into ministry. You will be pressured on the God of the Old Testament. You really believe in this God of the Old Testament that had his people, that had the Jews go in and kill, you know, men, women, and little children? Yes, I do. And a lot of Christians, they'll say, well, you know, the, uh, God changed. He doesn't feel the same anymore. You know, I see, they don't want that aspect of God. They don't want righteous judgment. They want love. You know, the average Christian, their perception of God is about, you know, like the a little teddy bear that lives up in heaven that just wants to hug everything. That's not God. That is not who God is. Okay? God is a God of wrath and judgment. That's another aspect to God. You know, Second uh, Peter chapter 2. We're going to turn to two more places and then we're done for today. Second uh, Peter chapter 2. Verse 4 says here, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Who rules hell? Who has the power of hell to cast into hell? God does. It's what the Bible teaches. It's not Satan. Satan does not rule hell. Continuing here, But cast them down to hell and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. You better be on God's right side. Okay? And I mean that both symbolically and, you know, literally. <laughs> okay? You better be right with God, but, you know, the Bible even talks about there at the judgment of the nations, Matthew 25, that he separates the goat, puts them, the goats, he puts them on his left hand, and the sheep go to his right hand. Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God. So I do mean you should be on God's right side, <laughs> definitely. And if you aren't, don't think that you're going to be able to get by and, oh, well, God will have mercy on me. And, you know, I, I think that God's going to see, you know, and just kind of weigh out the, no. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And if you're out there and you're fooling around and saying, well, you know, I just don't want to get saved yet. And I just want to see a little bit more proof. And I, let me tell you something. God's after you. And the first time that you reject Jesus Christ, God's wrath is upon you. The first time. God's long-suffering. But guess what? God's long-suffering with other people at different lengths of time. And you'll see some people that get to reject Jesus Christ all their life and then they die and they go to hell. But then you'll see some people that reject Jesus Christ the first time and God says, nope, you're done. You're going to go to hell and I'm going to burn you forever. Now God doesn't have pleasure in the death of the wicked. I understand that. And he wasn't sent to condemn the world but to save the world. I understand that. But what do you think is going to happen to you when you reject the incredible sacrifice of God's Son when you reject that. You say, well, I deserve God's uh, mercy. No, you don't. No, you do not. 
You should accept Jesus Christ the first time that you hear about him. And if you don't, God's wrath is on you. Don't fall for this nonsense that God loves the lost sinner that rejects Jesus Christ perpetually. That's a lie. There are a lot of things, uh, friends out there, that are being taught in these churches, and they have been taught for a long time, and they're just lies. Just total lies. Satan does not rule hell. He's not the big, the bad guy down there that's grabbing people and pulling them down into hell. That's not it at all. These people are rejecting Jesus Christ, and God is sending them to hell. You know, the Bible says, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The Bible also says that the nations that reject God are turned into hell. Guess what the future of America is? Heading for hell. Okay, one more place to prove, further prove the point. Revelation chapter 14, I, I kind of hit on this earlier. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 through 11. It says here, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you have something totally new that's never happened before. You have the beast, and he will be physically present. Right now, I don't know where Satan is dwelling. I don't know where his seat is. Okay, If people are looking, and I do believe they are, if the rulers of this world are looking physically on Satan... It's not being revealed to us. Okay? It's not there. All right? But in the tribulation, in the time of Jacob's trouble, they will be seeing the manifestation of Satan in the flesh. The Antichrist, the beast. The dragon gives him his power. Okay? A lot of people are innocent. They, they're, I shouldn't say innocent. They're ignorant of what's really going on. And they're made ignorant by... The propaganda that Satan puts out. But in the, and when, if they miss the rapture and they make it into the time of Jacob's trouble, there's not going to be any innocence anymore. There's not going to be any ignorance. There's going to be a man who is the Antichrist and taking his mark and worshiping him is going to guarantee these people that they will be cast into hell by God. It's going to guarantee it. No exceptions. No, well, I, I really was kind of dumb. You know, I kind of worshipped the Antichrist for a while. And, and then I came to Jesus and I got saved and stuff like that. Uh, right now, there are people who worship Satan and they get saved. And they forsake their old ways. There are a number of those guys. You know, Bill Schneblin, Doc Marquis. A lot of these guys were actual Satan worshippers. And... They were ignorant in what they were doing, but they're in the church age, so God has mercy on them. But in the time that's coming, if you miss the rapture, in that time it's coming, you worship Satan in that time period, you're done. You're finished. And we have to be careful as Christians that we do not back off and that we are not ashamed of God, of the God of this Bible. Okay? The God of this Bible, he has love. Yes, he is long-suffering. He offers peace. Okay? But he also has judgment. And we have to remember that the God of this Bible will damn anyone to hell that rejects Jesus Christ. You know, and a lot of the lost world out there, they think of their sweet, dear old little grandmother that makes cookies and she's nice and everything. And Well, did she ever accept Jesus? Well, no, but she's a, she's such a good woman. She was loved by everybody. It's just so friendly. And where is she right now? Screaming in hell. Oh, I couldn't believe it. No, I couldn't believe that. 
I couldn't believe that a loving God would send anybody to hell. He will if you don't accept Jesus Christ. Okay? Because you're the one that doesn't have the love at that point. You don't love the fact that Jesus died for your sins. It's very, very, very serious. And I'm going to tell you something else. Things are changing right now in our world. And I'm not trying to discourage anybody from witnessing. By all means, you should witness harder now than ever before. But, let me say this. People are becoming hardened to the gospel. I'm just stating facts, okay? Like I said, don't be discouraged. You know, keep preaching the word. You know, keep being faithful to the things of the Lord. But I'm seeing it. I'm seeing my brothers and sisters on the internet. Uh, I had a brother here recently that that uh, he was out mountain biking, you know, and, and he was riding along these trails and he'd stop when he'd see people and he'd try to hand them a track and they're, no, 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 no. I mean, it was like he was trying to handle them a, a live rattlesnake, you know, like, no, no, you know. And I know we've all experienced that kind of thing. You put a track down or you try to hand it to somebody and people like avoid it, they walk out around it. I'm going to give you another little statistic here. On Sermon Audio, there are there's a page that shows the views that you get. People looking at the sermons. And then you can see how many of those people are downloading them. We have, right now, as, as of last night, 6,252 people that looked at sermons and then wouldn't listen to them. What's going on? The time will come when they will not endorse sound doctrine. Don't get into ministry thinking that you're going to bring about a massive revival. Okay, that's the wrong motivation. The right motivation is to say, I'm not going to bring about nationwide revival, but I want to get that one person. And I want to teach that one person the truth. Okay, in the military, it's called a rear guard action. We're encircled by the enemy. They're breaking through the defenses. Okay, it is incredible to see how America is falling so quickly. Do not be deceived into thinking that we can turn it back and spare our precious little lives here. Okay, the longer we're here, it is going to get rotten. Really, really, really bad. And the temptation is going to be there to deny what the Bible says is coming and to deny what the Bible says about the God of the Old Testament and to deny the fact that it is God that sends people to hell. You know, this little sissy queer, this Rob Rob Bell or something like that, came out with this book called Love Wins. And it's about how God doesn't send anybody to hell. You know. That's wrong. That is a lie. He's a minister of Satan. But see, that's going to be the trend of modern Christianity. Oh, you know, I don't believe that a loving God would send anybody to hell. You know. Well, my grandmother died. She never went to church. Oh, she's probably in heaven. She's looking down right now on you, you know, and smiling and things. That's what you'll hear the lost people say. Oh, you know, so-and-so, he was a good guy. Yeah, he told some dirty jokes, and he was pretty foul and things, and, you know, really good with the ladies. But he's in heaven right now looking down. No, he's not. He's in hell screaming. And you know who put him there? God did. God put him there. Okay, I'm just I'm getting mad because I'm getting this thing from these modern Christians coming and dogging me all the time. Oh, you know you're not loving and you're, you're this and that. You're you know God is this and that. Eh. Yeah, whatever. You're gonna have to stand against these people. The tide is changing here in America. Christianity used to be respected, is now being looked down on. Don't fall away from the things of the Lord. Okay, I keep ranting and raving here, but uh, I guess we'll close. As I said, stick with the Bible. Don't worry about pleasing men. Fear the Lord. That's the beginning of wisdom. Do what God wants you to do. So that's going to be it for this morning. Thank you so much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. 
You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.